security. Uh, and see, like, a lot of gadgets. Uh, uh, but he's done, done a lot of good work in that area. Um, and has had a knack for coming up with very uh, cleverly named protocols. Most famously, the resurrecting testing protocol, and <laughs> cocaine option protocol, things like that. Um, so today he's going to talk about the project he's done trying to take sensor network to practical applications for building out the problem. Thank you. Thank you for coming, even though it's out of series. <laughs> so this project is a very interdisciplinary project that we set up. In fact, the civil engineers set up to uh, monitor large instances of civil engineering infrastructure, such as uh, subway tunnels and bridges and sewers and uh, things that serve entire cities. So my colleagues here uh, come, well, I'm in from the computer laboratory, I'm a security guy, uh, and uh, these other people, some of them, this is a civil engineering bridges person, this is a, a computer laboratory a radio propagation person, this is a, another a bridge and tunnels person, a bridge person and a tunnel a geomechanics expert. So this is a, a talk that is a paper being written which summarizes this uh, three-year-long project which is now in its third year. So I'm going to uh, give a kind of overview and um, interesting bits out of the whole thing. But I also have a core dedicated to security since that was my contribution to it and that was my specific interest. So first of all, I'm not sure whether I should be looking. <laughs> <laughs> looking at you and looking at that. Um, so the stuff that we deal with is usually very old. The tunnels, uh, the su tunnels of the London Underground are around 100 years old. I mean, sections of it were built in uh, Victorian times. And uh, the bridges, some of the bridges in Britain still date back from when the Romans uh, civilized the place. And uh, there are still uh, masonry arch bridges that are used for road traffic. I mean, it's not the majority, of course, but uh, uh, you can imagine how these structures are now not only deteriorating because of their age, but are also subject to solicitations and stresses that were not envisaged by the original designers. All the buildings that have been put on, on London after the tunnels were built, uh, not to speak of stuff uh, that is sent on these bridges that the Romans uh, couldn't think or would have to go there. So uh, this is to say it's obvious that we need to monitor the condition of stuff that is very old. But uh, even stuff that is not so old uh, may fall down. And there have been uh, recent uh, dramatic accidents of uh, bridges built in recent times that have collapsed with great uh, loss of money and in some cases life. Uh, so it is a necessity for the civil engineers to keep an eye on what's happening. And usually this is done by sending around men in hard hats uh, who have looked at stuff and note down things in their notebook and take pictures and things like that. And of course, this doesn't scale very well, and it's something that cannot be done very frequently. So if you want to have a continuous logging and history and be able to draw graphs about stuff, you want to do it more frequently and more continuously. And for that, you want to just install sensors that do that all the time. Uh, but doing that in this kind of structures with wires is a bit of a nuisance for installation. And therefore, uh, the, the thrust of this project was precisely, can we do the monitoring we want to do using wireless sensors? And they called upon us to help, uh, help them realize this, uh, this, this quest. So the radio propagation people, as I said, and I'm from the security side, and there's some other project partners which were not from Cambridge, uh, Imperial College London, doing something about the back end and so on, which I'm not going to talk about in, in this particular uh, talk, but uh, which were part of the overall project. So the question is, if we go out and buy a commercial off-the-shelf wireless sensor network system, can we do this thing that we want? I mean, imagine we are just civil engineers. We don't know anything about radio. We don't know anything about the Zigbee and all that kind of bullshit. Can we just buy stuff that the electrical engineers have done and do our monitoring? Because all we care about is the bridge. Uh, and so we try and answer this question. But uh, uh, you can anticipate a bit of skepticism in my voice. 
So problems of the commercial off-the-shelf uh, wireless sensor network systems that you can buy now uh, are, well, none of them do everything you need. And of the many systems that are available on the market, we chose uh, the Mica Z made by Crossbow because of a series of um, trade-offs that the civil engineers uh, thought were the best for uh, our situation. Uh, but a few problems that we had with that. The, the nodes that you deploy on site then have to form a mesh network and talk back to a gateway. And uh, we found that it took about an hour for them to form a mesh. And then you see, well, actually, but this one is not reaching the gateway. So we have to shuffle something around. And you redo that, you have to wait another hour. It took days to install the network. That was not very satisfactory. Um, some of the stuff we wanted to measure, you could just buy a sensor for it and attach it to the moat. Some other things, the sensor didn't exist, uh, especially for things measuring uh, geometry, such as deformation of pieces of concrete or um, uh, cast iron and things like that. So we had to build our own sensors and interface them to these modes. Uh, there is limited processing power in order to conserve the battery life, which means that some operations are not possible. Um, I'll describe an application in the next slide, which we wanted to do but couldn't. Uh, there's issues of electromagnetic propagation. That's where it was very useful to have a radio expert on board. And these things are not something that are described when you open the box and say where to place the things. And it, there's uh, a great deficiency in the state of the art here for things that would lead to a practical, useful deployment. And then uh, my own specific bit, uh, we found uh, an appalling number of security vulnerabilities in the, s uh, the firmware and the supplied backend applications of these, uh, these systems. Yes, uh, power is a, a problem that I it was obvious we were going to have, and so we didn't uh, find it as a big surprise. Say, oh, shit, now the batteries run out. Yes, we knew that that would happen. So, <laughs> uh, it is a problem, but not one that uh, we expect it to be solved in, in, a, in a system that's uh, just as solved. What are the things that an application domain like this uh, intends to monitor? Well, we do want to monitor environmental variations such as the ones that all these modes naturally do, such as uh, measuring the temperature, measuring the relative humidity. Every time you have one of these uh, manufacturers sell you a node, the first thing they put on is this kind of sensor because uh, mo the most obvious uh, don't depend on anything else. And we do have a use for monitoring these, but we also, as I hinted at, uh, needed to measure other things such as there is a crack in this uh, this concrete wall and we want to see if it widens from month to month uh, and how do we measure that none of the sensors that they provided could measure that so we had to build one invent how to build one and then build one uh, if you imagine a tunnel a tunnel is basically a big hole in the ground uh, and the earth would fall down if you didn't line it with kind of tiles that keep the earth where it is and so uh, a subway tunnel is the hole lined with big tiles that are made of cast iron or concrete, it depends. And if you have stresses and buildings built on top of it and things like that, then the hole that was maybe round becomes a bit oval. And then these tiles that were put in there go like that. And at the junction, you get cracks. And you want to make sure whether the inclination of these tiles is varying with time. So how do you measure the inclination of these things? So we had to build a sensor that would measure the inclination. Uh, in a bridge, suspension bridge like this one, this is the biggest of its kind in, uh, in Britain. It's called the Humber Bridge. It's not as big as the ones you have in America. Uh, you have these big suspension cables are made of tens of thousands of steel wires. And these steel wires are under great stress and they snap. A, a certain proportion of the steel wires will snap during the lifetime of the bridge it's taken into account from the start. Uh, but we want to keep an eye on the rate at which those, uh, those steel wires snap. Because if it's within the design constraints, we're fine. And if it's not, then we may have to tear down the bridge sooner than planned. 
So how do we check for that? Well, one technique is to go in with a big wedge and then prise open the steel cables and see what's happening and do a sample check of what's broken. And of course, this is a very intrusive operation which costs a lot to do, is not terribly reliable and may also break some extra cables while you do that. So you don't want to do that all the time. Uh, plus, it's, it's really hard. So another technique is to listen carefully for the sound of a cable going ping. And uh, you, you can do this uh, acoustic emission monitoring of breakages by sticking uh, microphones, ultrasound microphones, uh, all over the cable and then detecting from the speed of uh, sound in the steel. Yes. Electrically, I've never heard of this. I'm, I'm not a bridge person myself, but I've never heard of them mentioning that, and I don't know how you would isolate one steel cable from the other because it's just all in a big bundle. I mean, they, they don't have insulators between the steel cables. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, the answer, the correct answer is I've never heard of them even mentioning something like that. Uh, I'm not an expert on that particular uh, application domain. So acoustic emission is something where you need to sample at uh, at frequencies of uh, kilohertz uh, for this to be accurate, and uh, this is something that cannot be done with the processing power of the modes that we have. Yes. Yeah, I guess the, the feedback loop you're talking about is a fairly big feedback loop. And we are just building the feedback mechanism in this, this, in this three-year project. We are exploring the feedback mechanism. And uh, on a 20-year scale, you could imagine if this works out, that yes, the civil engineers would take this on board and build things to make it easier to monitor and then by that inform the way of designing the next bridge. But uh, it's much bigger scale than, than this project. Uh, I mean, we're just doing one step towards what you're saying, I guess. So I must stress that this project involves the academics I introduced in the, uh, in the opening slide, but also involves a number of infrastructure operators. So the, the guys who run this uh, Humber Bridge, the guys who run the London Underground, uh, the guys who own the sewers and uh, waterways and highways, uh, were all on board as industrial partners so that we could keep everything um, honest. We are not just doing things so that we can publish papers. We are doing things so that it's useful for people who actually run this. So uh, these were fundamental project partners, although they, they contributed to the project in a different way from uh, what we did. And this is the flavors of academics that we involved that I uh, described earlier. And it's important that the lead, although this was a project funded by the uh, a kind of uh, computing call of the uh, engineering and physical science uh, committee. Uh, it was a project led by the civil engineers so that it would be uh, driven by the application. So the place, the three places where we uh, did a practical deployment included uh, the Humber Bridge. This is the one of the four anchorage uh, underground anchorage rooms of the Humber Bridge, this big suspension bridge, the big um, uh, one meter diameter cable comes down, is opened up into this uh, strand of steel cables and is anchored into enormous blocks of concrete in an underground chamber. And so there's two for each side of the bridge. And this is one of the underground chambers where we have placed some nodes, some of them on the cables themselves, some of them in the environment. And here, they are essentially 
uh, monitoring the relative humidity to monitor for things like you know rusting of the cables and things like that. And of course, they were already monitoring relative humidity uh, with their own instruments in there. We wanted to see just you know if we deploy uh, the wireless sensor networks, we can then go and put a sensor in here, which you couldn't do before. We could just put sensor there. Of course, on the wall you could put them before, but let's use this as an excuse to see how then it works out with forming the network and all these other issues. So in here we clearly had issues of radio propagation because this is all concrete underground. There is a narrow tunnel between the two chambers uh, of that anchor the two steel cables and within this tunnel the radio has to propagate for going from the remote uh, chamber to the gateway which is in the near chamber of course. Yes. Uh, yes, here you would have power cables going around the walls, uh, but it would still be a nuisance to wire something up to something in the middle of the, the steel cable, for example. So if you have wireless connectivity to here, then you're happier putting the sensor wherever you feel like putting a sensor. Uh, but yes, in this case, if you're happy with just sticking things on the wall, then you don't really need a wireless system. Technically, it would also be possible to wire up a gateway repeater or something access point to the second chamber for this particular site but we use this as a as a test bed as a platform to see well what happens if you have a, a tunnel and you come from like this this is another bridge uh, on the same site as the Humber bridge it just happens to be a different construction different uh, style of bridge in there that is managed by the same people so we had access to it and uh, can't really see much on, on this picture, but there have been cracks detected on the underside of this bridge that we wanted to investigate. And also these supports. Um, here, the, the connection between this, uh, this concrete pillar and the bottom of the bridge is not fixed. It has some leeway so that you know, the bridge can expand all the things that bridges usually do. And so we wanted to monitor how this expansion was going on. So we had a um, series of sensors, uh, three to monitor the crack width, three to monitor the inclination of this uh, interface here, and one for monitoring the temperature. And here, uh, from a radio propagation viewpoint, there was a problem due to the fact that everything was on a single plane, which was almost touching the concrete. And so it was not the same as radio propagation in free space. And then the third site, or series of sites actually, was in the London Underground. Uh, we were given access to uh, two stretches of tunnels in the London Underground. Uh, this is a part of a uh, Jubilee line, and then there was another one, uh, Aldwych Tunnel. This was a dis disused one. So the second one, we, we would just do anything we liked, and there were no trains. And this one was one that instead we had to go at night when trains were not running, and then trains would go on during the day and we could see the effect of all that. So here we were measuring uh, these various uh, items here, displacement of the tiles, inclination of the tiles, temperature, relative humidity, and um, in terms of radio propagation there were issues of uh, how to model what happens when you transmit from one node to another in this environment because it's not at all the same as in free space. And there's almost no published studies on how radio propagation for the frequencies of ZigBee works inside the tunnel. So um, we've been trying, uh, looking for ways to write up what we did and how it, was, how it can be useful to other people. We came across a wonderful paper that I recommend to anybody doing work on wireless sensor networks, uh, which came out last year. The Hitchhiker's Guide to Successful Wireless Sensor Network <laughs> Deployments <laughs> by uh, people at uh, the EPFL in Switzerland. Uh, and we really like this paper. And it's written in a form of, you know, this is what we did. We did these installations, and this is um, the Hitchhiker's Guide with principles for you uh, to apply in your own deployment if you are going to do anything similar. And he said, well, we could do something like that because besides 
we explore the number of issues that they didn't explore. So we have different lessons for you, especially in terms of radio propagation, security, and so on. So we can be complementary. But they had a really nice format for communicating what you've done in a way that's useful to someone else, not just look how smart I am, I did that, but look, I've done that and I've been hit by these problems and you could uh, do that next time and not uh, suffer the same, uh, same problems perhaps. So in terms of installation, in terms of installation, you first start with a, a big multi-dimensional optimization problem when you want to establish where to put your relay nodes. If you have sensor nodes, it's pretty obvious where you want to put them. You have to put them the place where you need to measure the stuff. If there's a crack here, I can only put the sensor on the crack. But if I have a few sensor nodes and then they all need to talk to each other and go back to the gateway, where do I put the relay nodes? I have quite a bit of freedom in deciding where do I put the relay nodes. And how should I use this freedom? Well, I want to optimize for something. And what do I want to optimize? Maybe having fewest uh, relay nodes because they cost. They cost for buying them, they cost for installing them, they cost for changing the batteries. Uh, maybe no, maybe I want to have uh, guaranteed redundancy of paths between the sensor nodes and the gateway. So there's at least two independent paths between each sensor and the gateway. So that if something fails on one of the relay nodes, I always have a way to get back. Uh, or maybe I want to optimize for long-term maintenance costs, making sure that uh, you know the, the time between interval, the, the time between instances of me sending the men in, in blue overalls to change the batteries is longest. And so this means maybe balancing the load on the various batteries. So if I have one big relay node that everything goes through, then the batteries of that are going to run out uh, sooner than the rest. Or maybe, what? OK, are you going to put super big battery on that? Well, if I have a way of putting different size batteries on the various things, why don't I put the biggest battery on everything? All that kind of stuff is stuff that you have to think about when you decide what you want to optimize for when you place your relay nodes. And some of these things. If, you want, if you've decided, OK, I know what I want to optimize for. I want to optimize for a minimum overall ownership cost, for example. Right. You have to have a pretty accurate model of various things that go uh, at the abstraction levels below that in order for you to make any meaningful assessment of what the overall cost is going to be. Uh, and in particular, as we are going to see uh, next, you have to have a pretty accurate model of radio propagation if you want to make any sensible statements before going there as to which nodes are going to be able to talk to which other nodes. Oops, I had a extra click. So one thing that we uh, discovered as a worthy goal to go for after having done the thing a few times is planning for the least deployment time. Because uh, you go there and you put the thing on and I mentioned you know it took one hour to form the mesh and we had to you know, by trial and error spend several days uh, getting the thing going. Um, and that's not very nice. And if you're, if you're just sending down the research students, it's one thing. But if you're paying people to go there by the hour, it's another thing. And if you have to go there and you only have four hours because after that the trains restart and then they have to leave and then they have to come back the next day, then there's uh, serious implications about uh, taking, the least, uh, taking more than, than the least uh, possible amount of time to do a deployment. So as for radio, uh, radio is not my uh, field. And so some of the stuff that, uh, that occurred were a bit weird for us. Uh, when we were doing experiments in security, uh, things that looked obvious uh, weren't uh, what reality uh, told us. And uh, whenever you try and make plans on a piece of paper saying, OK, well, you have this thing, and this is the distance, and this is more or less the range of the nodes. But none of this actually works when you go and stick the nodes on the wall. Uh, for example, the various materials that you attach, the, th that the walls are made of, uh, and you attach nodes to, uh, absorb radio or reflect radio in various ways. And just sticking it uh, a few millimeters closer to the wall makes a huge difference as to the um, the propagation uh, and path loss that you have. Yes. Uh, one of the things that was experimented with is exactly uh, how do the various channels, uh, Zigbee has 16 channels, how do the various channels propagate? Uh, and I'll have uh, some slides on that uh, just very soon. So if you 
send your research student with the spectrum analyzer to monitor whether uh, you can still receive at this point. And he may give you an answer, and when he goes away, you get a different answer. Uh, so uh, you really do need people who understand se radio seriously if you want to make any progress. So. Oh, there is some. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, so the first thing is that whatever model you use, you must calibrate it with real measurements. So uh, much of the work that my colleague Ian Watson and his students did was just go down go down there in the periods that the, the, the trains are not running and do a measurement and then move five meters, do another measurement, move five meters, do another measurement for the whole night. So this is uh, a summary. I mean, this is just nothing more than a pretty picture, but it's an, ex an excuse to talk about various parameters that they were looking at. The greater than sign doesn't mean greater than. It means it works better than. Uh, center means if you stick something in the center of the tunnel, compared to sticking it on the wall or transmitting from one side to the other side and so on and so on. Uh, center to center, which is the thing that usually happens in papers, works better. But you can't actually put the sensor in the middle of the tunnel. You can't even hang it down because then where, the tra the, 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 where does the train go? So uh, this is uh, this frequency and this other frequency, two frequencies used by these nodes, there is no greater than sign because it depends. And it was the case that for the center to center, this frequency was better than this frequency. But for the center, for the side to side, uh, then it was not as, uh, there, there was no definite advantage of one frequency over the other. What if you have a wall lined with cast iron or lined with concrete? That also makes a difference. Cast iron seems to work better. Uh, what if you have a straight path or a curved path? It's easy to guess that the straight path works better. Works better means you have uh, a lower path loss at the uh, same distance. And these are all diagrams that you quantify these very qualitative statements with. Is it more on radio propagation measurements? What happens here is you show the pattern of um, you know, how many dBs you're getting in various places. And bl blue means I'm not getting very much. R red means I'm getting a lot. And this is how this varies with, uh, on this axis, how far you are from the wall. And this is not, not by very much. This is uh, 0.6 centimeters, so this, is this much. Uh, 2 centimeters, this much. Uh, 3, 6, 12, and 25 centimeters, this much. So just over this, you have this huge difference depending on you know, how far from the wall your antenna is. And on this other axis, you have different materials for the wall, cast iron, concrete. I can't read this one. Uh, polythene, yes, OK. Polythene pro is probably not the wall. <laughs> it was what was, uh, backing, uh, what was backing the antenna. So just raw or with, with, a, uh, with a support. And you can see dramatic differences in, in the propagation pattern which you might not uh, expect just from just from shifting a few centimeters. Then if you want to do all these optimizations we were talking about at the, at the beginning and optimize the placement of your relay nodes, you need to be able to tell from a picture of the place where you're going to place the nodes which points uh, are going to be able to hear something that is transmitted from which other points. Uh, that's essential, of course, for make building a software planning tool. And so uh, you need a uh, good propagation model for radio. And uh, there are analytical solutions. You can write equations for things like free space or the plain earth model. But for things that are not that, that have boundary conditions like a tunnel does, uh, you can't solve this analytically. And if you try to solve it uh, numerically, then the three-dimensional um, uh, finite difference time domain calculation at an appropriate resolution for having accurate results is incredibly expensive. It's something that on a modern computer would take weeks uh, to do for the size of structures that we were interested in with the tunnel. So uh, we couldn't use that. And um, Ian and his students developed a new model, which is a modified 2D version, which 
uses the structure of a tunnel for simplifying, using the symmetry, simplifying some of the calculations. And this is something that can run in reasonable time. And this is a, uh, one of the big uh, one of the big results in that field from this project, this uh, new model that uh, is now a famous thing in the literature. And this is another pretty picture which just validates this model. That's a simulation results in black and the field measurements in red, and there aren't uh, enormous gaps between the two. So it shows it's good. So um, this is all stuff to say the various steps to go from uh, measurements to uh, validated model to something that we can then use to uh, make quantitative statements in our uh, in our uh, planning tool for deciding where to put the relay nodes. This is uh, okay. Reality bites. Uh, you decided that the node should go somewhere, uh, and then after you've stuck it there, you experience fading. What do you do with that? And that's where we decided, okay, why don't we play around with uh, frequency diversity as well? That was an earlier question. Uh, and in order to evaluate whether frequency diversity is going to help in this case, we have to do a quantitative investigation of what happens in terms of path loss at the various frequencies for each one of the channels. Is there enough diversity to be able to uh, completely change? I mean, I can't hear it uh, in this position at this frequency, but maybe on another frequency I can hear it. And uh, this is already a three-dimensional diagram. You'd have to make a four-dimensional diagram if you wanted to also include the distance from the transmitting node, which, uh, which is another significant parameter because it does change uh, with the distance. And for example, at 10 meters from the transmitter, a difference of just one channel is enough to get a different propagation characteristic. At a distance of 50 meters, you need to be at least three of these channels away in order to have a difference. Just the adjacent channel, yes? Was there a time axis? Uh, I guess to see whether the fading was something that was static or something that was variable due to other uh, other influences from other stuff that I can't think of, but they did measure whether the fading was just a static thing or something that was varying. And it did, doesn't seem to change much. I mean, it's, it's the axis in which it uh, changes least. So yes, at some, at some distances, one channel of, of these 16 channels is enough separation. But at some other distances, you need to go further away in order to have a benefit. So that's all I'm going to say about radio, which is probably more than you wanted to hear. Uh, and <laughs> I'm going to spend the next bit on the security. How much, how much time do you want me to talk for? More? 25 minutes. OK, right. So um, security, the first thing was to try and find out what needed to be done for real, as opposed to what the security people wanted to do, because it was fun to do as for uh, you know, stuff that security people like to do, or can we put more crypto here? And we said, OK, let's try and find out if anybody wants to have this crypto for some purpose. So we did uh, have interviews with the manager of this uh, big suspension bridge, with the managers of the uh, London Underground and stuff like that. Uh, and it turned out. You know, even in these times where uh, there's a magic word, you know, when you were little, you were growing up, uh, your mother probably told you, there's a magic word. If you want to get anything, say the magic word. What's the magic word? Please, please. And then, then you probably get it much more like. Now, today, the magic word has changed. The magic word is terrorist. <laughs> you want to get some money? <laughs> Just say terrorist. And then uh, you can get anything you like. So in this case, strangely, even by saying the magic word, uh, <laughs> saying the magic word to say, look, what if a terrorist wanted to bring down your bridge? Uh, the bridge guy was unfazed. He says, I don't care. I mean, they can do what they like. It's a big piece of concrete. It would take them lots of work to, to do anything. If they, they, have, if they don't have a, a, a truck 
full of uh, of explosives that it's going to be hard to park underneath because you know, where, where the pylons are it's all water and stuff like that they're going to have a hard time doing anything serious so i'm not worried so um the um I mean, out of joke, the thing, one of the things that we wanted to figure out is, OK, if we install a wireless sensor network on a structure like a bridge or a tunnel, is this going to make it easier for someone with malicious intent to cause some damage on the structure, damage of, of any possible kind? And uh, certainly, it's, it's possible by fiddling with the wireless sensor network to make the readings of the wireless sensor network meaningless. That's clear. Can you have an effect on something other than the network itself by, uh, by hacking the network? And in that case, we wanted to figure that out. And, and the guy at the bridge says, you know, I don't think that this is going to do anything. And uh, I don't care so much about the network in the first place. Because right? everything I need to know about the, the bridge, I can see from my control chamber here. I have direct sight of the bridge. There's wind. I can see the windsock. All the stuff that you guys are going to put, it's nice to have, but I'm not going to die if the, all, the whole thing disappears. And I'm certainly not going to attach any actuators to the stuff that you're going to put up. So, yes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, I guess, uh, yes, I guess this uh, is a, a still something that would not affect uh, the safety of the structure as a whole. It, it is a threat that we ought to consider in economic terms, but it's not one that's going to bring down the bridge, I guess. So, uh, I mean, it, it was nice to see someone very relaxed about security issues. Usually people are very worried. This guy just g didn't give a damn. I said, well, anything. You, you can do whatever you like. I'm not, I'm not so worried. Uh, the London Underground guy was a bit more worried uh, he said, you know, um, basically, I don't know what's going on down there. So the more stuff you guys give me in terms of sensors, knowing what's up, you know, I don't want to lose these eyes. And certainly, I don't want other people to know before I know, because I'm going to be very embarrassed. So if there's going to be a problem, you know, I want to know about it and have a chance to fix it before it goes on the front page of the newspaper. Yes. Yes, so there is a, there's obviously a big difference between the false positives and the false negatives. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you can easily cause false alarms and cause lots of costs for checking out the false alarms and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it is a lot harder to exploit the false negatives, which would be, you know, the bridge is falling down and I'm telling you, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, until it really falls down because this only works if it was going to fall down in the first place, uh, which if you can't cause yourself, then uh, you're going to have a hard time exploiting. And if you can cause it yourself, then you don't care about the sensor networks so much. Uh, but yes, the, the false positives are uh, basically a kind of denial of service type of attack, which is uh, more important than the other in this case. So uh, the false positives bring us to this uh, point here that you know you're probably more interested in ensuring integrity of the sensor reports rather than confidentiality after all it's not a big deal uh, if people know what the sensors are saying about uh, the width of the crack it's more important that if it says the, w the crack has widened then it really has widened although as i said this must be qualified with the fact that the underground guy wanted to know that the crack had widened before it was on the page of the sun if it was true or even if it was not true. So, okay. Um, another important point is that sometimes it may be that hacking the wireless sensor network is not going to allow a bad guy to bring down the bridge, but it may allow a bad guy to get into your backend and corporate network because you have attached it to it so that you have uh, a view on uh, what the bridge is doing. So one important point 
in terms of answering that first question. Am I making this situation worse in any way by adding the sensor network from security viewpoint? Maybe you're not making the bridge more vulnerable, but you're making your backend more vulnerable if you can somehow get into the backend through a hole in the wireless sensor network. So that's something to consider, especially given how many holes we found. <laughs> so one uh, principle that we definitely feel like uh, recommending is that uh, whatever uh, commercial of the shelf system you choose, you, you had better do penetration testing on it, even if it says it's secure, or maybe especially if it says it's secure. So this uh, is my research associate on this project, Dan Svarcek, um, my research associate at the time, now he's moved on to other things. and. Uh, what we did with Dan was, okay, imagine that we are someone who doesn't care about wireless sensor networks technology. So we are a civil engineer. We want to do the monitoring because we care about the bridges and tunnels. We just buy the kit. If there is something that says security, we turn it on. Everything says security, we turn it on. We are good guys. We're not ignoring the advice of the security gurus. Uh, do we get a secure system? What's your answer? Probably no. <laughs> okay, so to, to give a qualified answer to that, we pretended to be the bad guys and we tried to hack the kit that the civil engineers had chosen. Uh, and I must say it was not very difficult to find holes. So uh, it, it claims it has <laughs> link level encryption. <laughs> uh, the literature says, you know, there's this stuff done by some, some clever people at Berkeley, which is... Uh, called uh, tiny sec and so the people who sell this stuff say yeah and it supports tiny sec and it's all very nice it supports it so well that as they changed the architecture they uh, didn't make it uh, uh, even compiled for the new radio chip so one of the things we did is uh, port this tiny sec to that um, there's some extra software that they give you or sell you or give us part of the package as well as the software that runs on the modes. Uh, and this software is, software is affected by featureitis. So there's a piece of uh, middleware that sits on the gateway that even contains a web server. And guess what? Uh, we could find a uh, bug in one of the scripts of the web server that made us completely own uh, the uh, gateway. And uh, if you run this on the back end instead of just on the gateway, you can completely own the back end but you become root. So, uh, of course, this is one bug that you can just fix that script. Once you know what it is, then it, it's easy to fix. But it comes about because, you know, what's the point of putting even a web server in uh, the damn gateway of, of ju just supposed to aggregate the, uh, the packets from the various points? I, is the, compet the competition between the vendors of this uh, stuff is based on who has the most features. And they don't compete on who has the tightest, tightest security. The foundation of this software th is this uh, um, tiny OS. And this is a very Spartan, very lean piece of uh, software, which doesn't have that many holes, uh, especially because it has the philosophy of not having anything that's not needed. So what isn't there doesn't break. It's the first principle of engineering. Uh, but the stuff that they give you on top of it uh, has so many other features that it's easy to find uh, attacks in this uh, enormous uh, surface. Now just to show the attitude, uh, we bought this piece of hardware, the SAR gate is the name, of the commercial name of this gateway. Uh, we bought it in 2007 at the start of the project. At the time we bought it, it was the latest model available on their catalog. Uh, and it's basically a Linux box in a ROM, the same kind of stuff that you have in your wireless router at home and so on. Uh, and it was the latest one in 2007, but it had uh, these standard vulnerabilities which were unpatched from 2002, 2003, 2003, 2004, 2005, 2004, 2005, 2005, 2003, uh, which let you get a local root, remote root, a remote root, lo local root, remote shadow, all that kind of stuff. Uh, there was a default password, weak default password for root uh, and for the super user of the database, and the documentation for people who buy this stuff uh, doesn't even say how to change the password, never mind suggesting that you change the password. So uh, it's not a high priority. There is a feature of 
uh, over the air reprogramming of the flash memory of the nodes and uh, it's uh, not authenticated <laughs> okay so you can just own everything um, there is a uh, maybe this is a slightly more technical thing that we did I don't know if I should go into excessive detail with it but it's obvious that when you have a radio network you can do jamming uh, and we thought what more interesting things can we do uh, maybe we can do selective jamming we can jam the nodes uh, according to a certain criterion if they come from a certain node if they go to a certain node uh, if they have a certain type uh, and we did implement this selective jamming uh, technically it's not as trivial as it may sound because you need to uh, obey very tight timing in order to detect what type of packet it is and still be ready to jam it before uh, it is received at the other end um, uh, but we did it and we uh, we could with this as a building block also rewrite packets send another packet and pretend that it was uh, what had arrived and uh, we used that uh, also for um, uh, other tricks and another thing we did was uh, manipulating the routing table of the nodes uh, based on a reverse engineering of the way in which the routing tables were built by uh, the software supplied by uh, the vendor uh, once again uh, all these messages unauthenticated and unencrypted uh, it's now uh, something that you would have expected uh, we wrote some software to make them believe something that was not the truth about who their neighbors were and by that we could rewrite the routing tables do whatever we liked and through that we can have a sleep deprivation kind of attack where we make the routing table such that they zip messages between one and the next thinking that they're sending it somewhere else and instead they're basically spending all their time in this loop which shouldn't exist and they drain the battery uh, in uh, a very short time because all these battery lifetimes of months are based on a duty cycle of a fraction of a percent and if you manage to keep them transmitting all the time then uh, these months become less than a day to flatten the battery so uh, this is something that an attacker could do just by going and uh, you had the Ferriby Road bridge you park your van underneath just talk to the nodes you know do this kind of attack, reprogram the routing tables, drive the van away. I, by the end of the day, the uh, sensor network has drained its batteries. Yes? <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> That's brilliant. I must make a note of that. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. <laughs> okay. Right. So uh, if we are dealing specifically with civil engineering deployments, then a few lessons uh, in that department. Uh, okay, well, you have to do a preparation and a dry run so that you can be as quick as possible when you go and deploy stuff on site. Um, to our shame, uh, we have to admit that the London Underground Limited Network took us, took us 15 visits to install, and that was for a network of maybe 30 nodes or something like that. So, um, yeah, planning here. That's when we, we decided we are going to make a planning tool. Um, you must ensure your sensors keep working and don't fall off. This is stupid advice, right? So, um, people talk about... <laughs> Say again? Right, okay. Okay, well, you, you have this slide already, then I don't need to, to go over it. So, yes, um, we started uh, sticking something up with a, a high strength epoxy, and then on a cold March morning, the epoxy would not set, and then uh, even the ones that did set after a year came off and stuff like that. Uh, another interesting thing is that we, we put these sensors in uh, ruggedized boxes and uh, we're all neat and you, you imagine a tunnel is a place where nobody goes except the train so you know, nobody's going to disturb this stuff and after a few weeks next inspection it was all coated in black dust from the brakes of the trains 
And so this stuff uh, can also be conductive, and you have to make sure you have the right uh, isolation between all these things because you know your sensor might stop working because of uh, all this dust going everywhere. Uh, as I mentioned at the start, sometimes you want to measure things that the manufacturers don't make a sensor for, so you have to make your own. This is a sensor we make for uh, measuring how wide the crack is, and basically we stick uh, linear potentiometers across the crack, and by seeing how far they go, we see uh, how many millimeters the crack has widened. And another one we did was this uh, inclinometer. We made use of a MEMS inclinometer in here, and then you 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 drill this box to attach it to the tile that you're measuring, and then you would measure to a thousandth of a degree how uh, how the angle of this with respect to the vector of gravity has changed. Then um, another principle from my colleague from uh, Bridges Land: you must be prepared for the unexpected to happen, and by that he refers to an incident where some of the inclinometers we installed on the underground, after six months, stopped working. Why? Uh, and then some connector had come unsoldered, and we tried to figure out why. Uh, and the explanations we could come up with is that one, the guy who did the soldering wasn't very good, and the other guy, the other thing was that because of the new regulations now of using lead-free solder, then the soldering is not as mechanically strong as it used to be. So we redid them by using a different company and telling them uh, we are not selling to anybody, so you don't have to follow this regulation. <laughs> Just use the lead-based solder, <laughs> and that's <laughs> it. <laughs> so um, you must be able to find out exactly what happened. This refers to another anecdote where uh, it looked by the readings that many of the inclinometers had fallen off, and so we went there trying to you know reattach them to the correct places, and they hadn't fallen off it was that the battery had drained to a level that was sufficient still to drive the radio, but uh, not to give the reference voltage to the sensor. And then it looked like the angle had changed dramatically. <laughs> so you have to have some kind of independent way of checking what actually happened. And perhaps we were thinking, maybe we should stick a camera every few sensors so that we can see what's happening. You know, not the trivial uh, solution in a tunnel. Maybe for the bridge we could do something like that. Or anyway, so have some other independent check of things because otherwise every time you have to send the people in there uh, you know has to be done at night and they have to go down the hall it's a big expense yeah but if we know that we have to replace batteries every three months it's one thing if we, we have the sensor that say at, at, at the third week okay everything is now fallen off has it really fallen off we'd rather know before we send someone in and then this last few, few pieces of wisdom, say, okay, you, you got data, and uh, why are you collecting this data? Uh, what's the purpose? So in the Ferriby Road bridge, the one that is not the suspension bridge, I said there was at the interface between the pillar and the bridge, there was some um, something that could give. It's, it's actually a, uh, a rubber bearing, and we wanted to measure how far this was going. And so can I draw on this with this marker? So if the thing is normally like this, maybe those people that won't see. Okay. If if the thing is normally vertical, we want to say, okay, is it going to be like that, like that, like that? Is it going to be too much? Is the rubber going to break? So we just wanted to measure the inclination of this displacement. So how far has it gone this way? I said, right. Well, we just built ourselves a, a, an inclinometer. Why don't we stick one of those in there? And then they had very weird results coming out. And the reason is because this rubber didn't deform this way. It deformed more like, like this way. And so depending on where you had stuck the, the inclinometer, you would get a totally different answer for the same displacement. So the correct thing to do would have been to measure the displacement with something that measured you know, how far off it has gone. Uh, and we used an inclinometer because we had just built an inclinometer. It was the wrong thing to do. So <laughs> you must think about what you're measuring, why you're measuring an, an angle with this uh, tool, and uh, does the data you get out of that uh, make any sense? And then, once you got the data, what do you do with it? You have to present it to the users, the end users, the people who run the bridge, the subway, and so on, in a way that makes sense to them. And so uh, we had a summer student 
uh, implement this interface with Google Earth, where the, the data that comes from the sensors is placed on this superimposition of a view of London. This is the tunnel. This is the ring, specific ring of the tunnel where we have the sensors. And if you click on one of these pegs, you get all the data from the sensors. And this also allows us to show the spatial relationship between, for example, the inclination monitoring sensor to something else that might be, might be um, a completely different network, such as the one for the sewers. I mean, there's uh, we are monitoring uh, the waterways and sewers and stuff like that. And it's interesting to know where there is something that goes near another one of these. Because integration of these various systems might mean if there is a problem in one, we see what the effect is on the other. Uh, although this uh, sometimes has uh, problems uh, at a higher organizational level when people don't feel comfortable about sharing uh, the information with uh, people that are from another organization. Anyway, so in closing, um, the main thing you get out of a project like this is you realize that the wireless sensor networks are sold by the companies that make them, mostly to uh, researchers, universities, people who get grants for installing wireless sensor networks, not people who install the sensor network because they want to measure something. So uh, this is reflected in what is on offer at the moment. And so uh, at the moment, it is definitely still not possible to go out and buy something and do the measurement. You have to be a co-developer if you want to have a system that works in the end. And things that still need uh, quite a bit of work that was uh, highlighted in what we did are the radio side propagation models for complex environments. This is something that's absolutely necessary if you want to be able to do anything more than trial and error when you install uh, your relay nodes um, and again efficient exploitation of the channel diversity uh, the zigbee nodes were not planned for going into tunnels uh, the different channels are useful up to a point uh, it would be nice to develop a one pass algorithm for the installers that they can go up put up the scaffolding make the uh, drill holes install the thing and then they know that that location they have visited they can move the scaffolding somewhere else and that's it not having to revisit each location several times for tuning moving things around because that's very expensive security should be taken uh, more seriously at the moment the fight is on features not on security and um, we hope that uh, this work will help uh, both the new adopters and also the people who are still making them uh, for the next generation so uh, the wireless sensor networks do need to mature. They do show some promise. The people who were uh, owning the structure said, yeah, if, if all this stuff you're doing uh, one day worked, we would be very keen to have it. Thank you very much. But <laughs> we're not going to rely on it right now. <laughs> okay, that's it for me. Any questions? <laughs> yes.
fairly hard for an adversary to interfere with your communication in a reliable way to get on the network because it's in the middle of a tunnel and the only way to get there is on train to go sideways. So, I mean, I can see in a bridge it's uh, open in the air. Yeah. Uh, if you're a checker, you can get into the tunnel yeah. instead of you, you, you get some physical <laughs> security by being in the middle of a tunnel. Yes, yes. So, so we did emphasize the fact that in many of those cases, the physical security of the of the structure is the, I mean, the most relevant aspect. And if you can get there and you can, you know, put a node that disturbs other nodes, you might as well just put a stick of dynamite. I mean, why bother with the nodes? <laughs> but still, uh, it is not uh, it is not inconceivable that someone may ga gain access to uh, some part of the uh, of the network. I mean, it's just manholes with padlocks. It's not that hard, right? Uh, and you can also throw something from the wind of a train that still is there and emits packets in, in a way that you've prepared at home or something like that. I mean, I don't expect that someone would be able to do the same as parking a van outside and seeing the packets and then do something in real time. But maybe dumping something that's been pre prepared, especially if the place you're monitoring is not that far from the place where you get off the station. No, well, this is something that uh, we pointed out. You know, you have to, uh, you know, have your thing uh, tried and tested in the lab before you go, uh, and this means for a long time. But these guys, the hitchhikers guys, also uh, say something about that. This is something that, uh, we, I mean, we're not the first to mention. That you have to, basically, what they what they do, uh, which is a. Uh, but it's not practical to, to figure out how that device ages over 15 years if you want to be deploying it the next year. Sure it is. People deploy sensors all the time. They do accelerated lifetime testing. They do it for spacecraft simulations. They use calibrated. There's lots of, there's a big literature in figuring out how a system ages without having to wait by exactly any time. Sure, but it's not always, it's depending on the situation. There's certain things like tensile strength over time which is not necessarily going to be as reliable. There's a big literature in material Didn't science yeah. and, and, and civil engineering and whatever. But my next point is that lots of other life critical systems depend on these methods already, so we've got increased. Uh, yes, but what they're what they're what they're testing is different. They're testing what's sufficient in order to survive, rather than will you get a slightly different measurement over time, and will you, that get you different scientific data back? Right. So. Uh, if you if you want to find out how resistant something is to, to pounding, you can pound it you know, the same number of times, but it won't it won't necessarily tell you all the things that that change over time when it comes to precise measurements, like exactly how far did the little strand get right. pulled. Does anybody who makes scientific instruments has to solve this problem. Otherwise, your instrument rips out of calibration. Um, yeah. Well, I, I guess I guess the thing to observe here is that the the the, the, no, the nodes that are sold nowadays because they are in that league are not really made as a scientific instruments they're just made as you know radio shack things with right. a you sensor need, on you need a commercial you need something that can be fixed commercially and then yes <laughs> okay should we draw this to a close yeah. it looks yeah. like uh, <laughs> i've run out of time <laughs> thank you very much